Okay? When we say denominationalism, what comes to mind? What are your thoughts when we say denominationalism?
Assemblies of God. I don't care if you're Alliance. I don't care if you're Catholic. Okay? In, if, if we're sharing the same scriptures, we're Jesus. We're in Christ. And He is the Word of God. And there's no separation in denomination, in organization, where my membership doesn't count, but yours does, or vice versa. And you've got to get baptized to do this and do these rituals, and you have to agree to these things. That's not the way that Jesus was. He gave us the Scriptures. And so if you believe in the Scripture, and I believe in the Scripture, then we can sharpen swords so we can look at the scriptures together. And the spirit that teaches us all things, he's going to challenge both of us on what, it, what we believe. Amen? Does that mean there's still false teaching? Sure. But false teaching should be easy to see because if you go to the scriptures and it says do A, B, C, and someone comes and says, oh no, you need to do D, E, and F, and you say, well, in the scriptures it says A, B, C, and you're saying D, E, F, then you can kind of tell that they're false teaching. Okay? All right. So but this is the big difference here in these models of ministry to try and get you to see when we're sharing with other people how a fellowship church is going to be different. It's going to pull in people from all different denominations. And we're going to surround ourselves with the scriptures. And we're going to have deep theological conversations, and we're all going to learn because we're going to have a Calvinist over here, and we're going to have an Arminian over here, and a Lutheran over there, and a Baptist. And we're all going to talk about baptism. And when you put all those that group together and you start talking about baptism, you're going to learn about baptism. You're going to dive into the Word of God, and you're going to you're going to grow in the Spirit of God. Okay. All right. The thing to know here is that everything outside of God's plan results some way at some point in sin. Okay? Denominationalism, where we purposely split and divide the body of Christ at its very root, is a sin. It goes against the very scriptures of unity and oneness in the bride of Christ. Okay? Now, does that mean that all those churches are bad? No, absolutely not. In fact, God uses the mistakes that we make to do His glory. And the weakness that we have, He uses to do great things. And so the denominational system has worked for many hundreds of years. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the Spirit of God might not be moving towards something else as we change, just like the horse and the buggy. There's something that's better. When we all get to heaven, do you think we're going to be Baptists and Lutherans? We are not. So why aren't we acting like it here? All right, so let's get to our scripture. What we're doing here is we're going to point out the root of the sin that it is bound in the foundations, in the cornerstone of denominationalism, where we separate the body of Christ based on theology, uh, based on people groups. Okay? And this is where it starts. So we're in Luke chapter 12, 13 through 24. And someone is about to speak to Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher! Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And so here God is talking about, or Jesus is talking about the sin of greed. Okay, now when you think of church, we don't just automatically think, oh, greed. Okay, and you're not supposed to. Church is a great place. Okay, I grew up in a denominational church. Great things have happened to me through my denomination and my church. But we're talking here about this root thing that's now affecting these denominations as the sin is starting to manifest from within it. OK? 
Okay? Greed and uncontentment. Who here has ever been greedy or uncontent? Okay? I, I know I have. I know there's some perfect people here. Okay? But <laughs> greediness and uncontentment is it's just ugly. Right? Uh, I know, like, I see this in my children all the time. What? If you have two boys that are around the same age, and one is doing something, the other one wants to do that same exact thing. If one person gets a privilege, the other person wants to get the same privilege. If one gets one cookie, the other one wants one cookie, and maybe even another cookie. But if you give them another cookie, you have to give the other one a cookie. In fact, it reminds me of a story when we were doing some shopping for in Walmart. Oh, this is horrible. Okay? So, my wife, I think it started with, she went to one of my sons and said, oh, why don't you go pick out something for a dollar uh, in the store, right? And both of them, just go pick out something for a dollar, right? So one of the kids picked out something, probably Lynn, because he obeys, he's the firstborn, born. He picked out something for like 99 cents, right? Yeah. Okay? Cool. Right there at the dollar mark. But Hunter, he found something for a dollar seventy-nine. <laughs> Not a big deal, right? But it was a big deal. Why does he get 79 more cents? 78. 78 more cents. And so, you know what mom did? Okay, all right. You could go, go buy another uh, dollar thing, right? So he went and bought another dollar thing. So he had two dollar things. And the other son had 178, right? 179. So what, what did that other son say? He's got two gifts. I only got one gift. I should be able to get a second gift, right? So he found like a $3 gift that was super excited about it. Oh, mom, I love you. Please, oh, can I get this? Oh, this is amazing. Oh, right? And it just went teetered back and forth until she spent like $60. Oh, what? It was. It was like I was like, what? Is it birthday time or what? It was supposed to be like a Hot Wheels car. We were walking out the super soakers. Anyway, <laughs> greed and uncontentment, okay? The brother who asked for his siblings' inheritance was not in need here. We have to understand this. Okay, the way that it worked was when the dad passed, he was the head of the household, he gave the inheritance uh, and everything to the oldest son. Okay, because the oldest son would run the business and the farm. Okay, but that son didn't get to have all the farm. Eventually, when the other children would go on their way, mostly the brothers, he would have to divide the inheritance and give them each a certain portion. Now, the good part is the firstborn, like me, we get two portions. So it's kind of nice. So if there's two brothers, the oldest brother gets two-thirds, and the youngest brother gets one-third. So I think it's a very fair system. Okay? So, but here, <laughs> the girls didn't get anything. They were like property back there. Okay? Discrimination. So what's going on here is the dad has died, the older brother has the whole farm, and the younger brother, who's not starving, who's living there at home, He's doing his normal things. He's like, hey, I want my inheritance right now because I want it. I don't care if I'm living here. I just want it right now. Let's get it done. Right? Yeah. And he goes to Jesus because Jesus is his judge. You know, he's acting righteously, giving people righteous advice. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get Jesus to tell you to do it. And then you're going to do it. Right? And Jesus is like, I am not your arbiter, okay? And then he talks about the root of that conversation, which is greed and uncontentment, okay? All right. Coveting is the sin that flows out of greed and being uncontentment.
I'm content. Okay, what does God say about coveting? Yes, it's one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor. Okay, what they have. You shouldn't strive to have more so that you can have what they have. It's the, the basic brotherly sibling thing. Okay? One M&M, it's like an M&M &M for an M&M. &M. No, it's not always that way. Okay? And, but that's coveting, and that's a sin that grows out of our worldliness. Okay? Jesus shows us that we don't need to seek more or to have equality with others because his life has nothing to do with what we have. Do we remember how valuable his life is? Scripture talks about it, how it's the most precious gift that anyone could ever receive. It's so precious that a man would sell everything he had just to have that one gift. It's the thing that we're supposed to seek after, the life of Christ. So, what's happening here is we're supposed to not care about what other people have because we're so focused on this life thing. Amen? That's where our, our focus is. Okay? Alright. So how does denominationalism, this is the old system, like I said, it's a system that's worked for hundreds of years, but how does it promote coveting? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Bigger, better programs. If the church down the street had a nice pool table put in for their youth group, man, we gotta get ourselves a pool table, right? Yeah. They got a gym. Don't move my piano. Shh. Just my mom. There's no more. 
And the picture on the back wall of the Sunday school room, don't move that. Oh, why? Okay? All right. Anyway, I get that. <laughs> Isn't it sad? Isn't that petty? It's petty. Okay, that's denominationalism. Oh. They want to own their own oh, corner of the truth. Oh, you guys are wrong. You're wrong on baptism. You're wrong on speaking in tongues. You're wrong on this and this and this. Why? I don't even know if you're going to heaven. Why? You guys are so messed up theologically, right? Okay? But if you want to make sure you get to heaven, come to our church. Yeah. Become a member, and you'll be good. Right? Because we got we got the corner on the truth. Okay? That's denominationalism. Okay, they want to own a corner on the truth and claim a special place among God's people. Denominations rely or, or denomination really means division. Be it through apostolic apostolic succession. Okay, that's where it's apostolic succession, where it's you gotta be touched by someone that was from the apostles, and there's this big line. So if you're not in that line, you're not part of the church. Okay. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, niche doctrines. I, I came out of a church that they cared so much more about their doctrine, like the other doctrines didn't even matter. It was just that one that was the special one that was theirs. It was the one they wanted to advertise and say, look, look at what we got. We got this doctrine here. This is the truth. You don't got this. This is ours. You can come with us. Yes. Or you have to leave what you're doing. We got the we got the shoot. Okay? okay? Links to great teachers or multi-million dollar facilities. Most of today's denominations are clawing and scratching for more money, for fame, for influence, and for people. And we have to understand that it's a root. The root of that comes out of coveting. It comes out of greed. It's not of the Christ, the body of Christ. Now, are those all bad? No, there's some really good churches out there. There's some really good denominations out there. But we're talking about the root of the difference between what we're going to be doing and what has always been done here. Okay? So let's continue in the scripture. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 here. So Jesus is done messing with this guy, and he turns to his disciples and he starts to teach them about greed. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't that sound good? It's like you won the lottery. That's really what it's talking about here. This is the lottery back in Bible days. Okay? His fields basically won the lottery that year. So we have to understand that there's going to be a, a right way of how to handle the Lord's blessing, and there is a sinful, covetous way to handle the Lord's blessing. Okay? God blesses the pants off his farm. And we have to understand that. Now he needs to decide what will he do with all the extra that he does not need. So it's not talking about what he wants. It's his need. His need has been way overfilled. So what's he going to do with the rest of it? We have to understand that there are times in every single ministry where God blesses the pants off the ministry. I've seen churches implode in less than six months after the Lord blesses the pants off them. You know why? Because if you give... Uh, $250,000 to a, a sinful church board that's got issues, they're going to kill each other. That's not good. Over that 
thousand. I've seen it happen. Okay? Uh, so God is going to bless the pants off of ministry at some point. Every church has times where they go through these seasons of blessing. And it's how we respond to the blessings of God that define us. At the beginning of every denomination, the only reason they have a denomination is because they have this, this influx of blessing. And you know why? Because when you start a denomination, you go and you look, just like us when we're doing kind of, you look at the church and you say, man, the church is messed up with this and this and this and this. And you say, the scripture says this, and they're doing that. Well, let's get back to this. And so what we do is we start doing this the best we can. And you know what happens when you leave that and you start doing this? Or what? This? Do you know what happens when, when you do that? You get blessed. Isn't it amazing? If you're not following God and doing worldly things with your church, you don't, you're not blessed. But when you get back to this, you start getting blessed. And so a lot of these denominations, when they start out, they have a heart for God. They're in the Word. They're, they're seeking God. And they're going through this time of blessing. And God blesses the pants off. So what do they do? What's our worldly response? What's our natural response when God blesses the pants off us? Go, we got to build bigger barns, baby. Woo-hoo! But is that what he wants us to do? Is that the godly response? No. Does he call us to build bigger barns? The most important thing to grasp here is that God... Provider. And if you're going to take one thing away from you from today about what the fellowship model of ministry is about, it's about having a church rely wholly, 100% on God's provision alone, which is very different from the traditional view of let's create the safest way that we can do church so that we can, can use the gifts that God gives us to the best of ability so that we can serve others. Okay? One is man-sourced of protecting and trying to grow the provision of the Lord. The other way is just having faith that we're going to use up everything the Lord gives us all of it, and we're just going to pray in faith that tomorrow He gives us what we need and even more to do the same thing every single day. It's a fundamental difference. Okay? But the important thing here is God provided. He will always provide for the things He wants to accomplish. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, it just makes sense. Did you know that God told Noah, or was it Noah that built an ark? Right? He told him to build an ark. Do you think he would provide the wood in the area for the ark to be built? It would just make sense, right? Do you think he would say to Noah in the desert, Noah in the desert, I want you to build me an ark of gopher wood. No, he wouldn't do that, right? And, and so we have to understand, if, if, if this is really God's ministry, and he's called us to do great things through his provision, we're supposed to have faith that he's going to provide out of nothing. And he's going to, it's just going to appear like manna. That's called having faith in God's provision. And it's a fundamental shift that the church has made a mistake on in the very foundational building blocks as they built the structures and organizations of their religion. So what mistake did the farmer make? Alright. He made the choice to no longer trust in God for his provision, and he relied on his own strength and his own power and his own control 
to secure the Lord's gift, however he saw fit, for personal use. Sure, I'm sure he was going to give people stuff if someone came over. But that sure wasn't his mindset. You know, it, I've seen churches where their mission statement is to grow and get out in the community and do all these things. But you look at their budget and they've got 3% going to evangelism. 3% out of every dollar. Three dollars out of every hundred dollars raised in the church goes towards the people in the community. That's because it takes money to build bigger barns. All right. How does this relate to the traditional church model? I think you can see it, right? When you create an organization, and you create a general superintendent or a pope or, or whatever, and you create a, a structure of ministry, and you create beliefs and doctrines, and you create a colleges and all these things that are, are controlling the provision of the Lord. You create a subculture of the body of Christ in the body of Christ, and you divide yourself. And we know that it's a selfish thing because, lo and behold, uh, you don't share. You don't. If someone wants to come to your college and they're, they, come, they didn't grow up in your church, man, we're going to charge you for that, right? No. But you know, if you're a pastor's kid, you're free, man. We're going to get you up because we want that third, fourth generation preacher in our system. Now, have you ever heard that? I'm a third generation man. Walked out of the church. 
The generation of my children has never heard about Jesus Christ except what they hear on YouTube. And believe me, what they hear on YouTube isn't good. What they hear in the schools isn't good. Jesus is bad. Jesus is judgmental. Jesus is hate. That's what this generation is hearing about Jesus. Okay? Out of the trillions of dollars raised to grow the kingdom of God, the blessings of God are lying dormant in larger storehouses as the life has been taken from their churches and their denominations. We're seeing splits of major denominations over cultural issues that are you would never even have thought about were happening 10, 15, 20 years ago. The church is imploding. Resources are being scattered. Lawsuits are flying everywhere. The church is in a state of turmoil. As we watch this great transformation of Christianity take place in America, we must learn from the mistakes of those who have gone before us and allow God to once again be our provision. Larger barns didn't work. They worked for a while. But then you know what happened? I've, oh, I've seen it. I've seen a group of saints that used to love the Lord, used to be vibrant in their community, used to share faith with everyone they came in contact with. And eventually, the barns needed maintenance. The barns needed repainting. The barns needed re roofing. One barn fell down, we had to rebuild that whole barn. And what happened is, is these saints, you'll find these churches where the building is now everything. 100% of their energy goes into maintaining a dead building so they can get together on Sunday morning in the building and worship alone with the light, the back lights off so we can save a little electricity. Is that what God meant for us, His church and His body to be? A dead building with a few people in it? Just, just waiting to close the doors and, and hoping that you're going to get a young pastor that's just going to fix everything real quick. It's a result of a foundational sin that is rooted in the cornerstone of the building blocks of how we constructed our churches. Alright? Being rich towards God is to take only what we need for ourselves and to gather what blessing is left and give it away as we love others with the excess. Do you see the difference there? God is going to bless the socks off us and He's going to, woo, man, can, can you, oh man, He's giving us all these people. Oh, we got to keep all these people. No. It's not our goal. We're called to make disciples and send people. How do you send people when you've got a building to pay for? Do you know, I've seen so many times where there's a person that's called a pastor in the church. They're called to preach. And you know what happens? The pastor kind of prolongs it as long as they can. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh I see it. I see it. Oh. And then eventually they send them to the systems college and they go there and then hopefully they come back. And then we make them an associate in our church for, you know, a certain amount of time. And then eventually when we can't hold them any longer and they jump through all the hoops and the red tape, we allow them to go take a really bad church somewhere in the woods. Is that what we're called to do? No, we don't want to give them a church right now. Can you imagine this? Someone in your church, they get filled with the Spirit of God and they feel like they want to preach the Word and share the Word with their friends and they start to share with this certain group of people that they interact with all the time and pretty soon they got 20 people meeting for a Bible study every week and, and it just keeps on growing from there. Is it okay to have another church with the same group of people just in the same town? And say, hey, we're going to help you do this. In fact, you know what? We're going to give you a couple elder families to help these new Christians 
mature so that you can keep growing this thing. But how in the world do you do that when you got a budget of $3,824 a month? Do you really want to send someone over there? What if they don't come back? What if we send someone that is best friends with someone else and then they don't come back? Do you see the problem? So our church is really trying to expand. No, fundamentally they're not. They're trying to protect what they have. Taking the provision of God, waiting for it, and taking the access and giving it away. It is the total opposite of covetous. It's where we humbly get on our knees and we allow God to bless us. And when He blesses us and blesses our socks off, we give thanks. We give thanks for what He gives us and then we take what we don't need and we give all of it to the people around us. And what do you think God does next? He gives you more the next day. It's manna. See, when you're relying on God, and He's the one that's, that's doing the ministry, and He gives you stuff, and you're giving it away, he, you know what He's... It, it's like, wow, wow, those guys did really well. I think I'm going to give them some more. Yeah, I think I'm going to give them twice as much blessing this time. See what they do with that. And then they build bigger barns, and what do you think happens? Oh, man, they messed up. Oh, I shouldn't have given that much. They couldn't handle it. Right? <laughs> it's a fundamental issue. All right. The traditional model is built to be self-reliant. You don't need to have faith if you're building a traditional church. Because there's marketing involved, there's a system involved, there's all these things that we've set in place through all the organizations, the doctrines, the traditions, everything's there. You don't have to have faith in God because it's just going to work. And it'll work for a while. Because God blessed the socks off you. But eventually, the storehouse begins to look a little more dusty. Because you've used all the blessing. And there's nothing more ornery than a group of Christians that are sitting in a big storehouse looking around and saying, um, I think we're running out. What do we do now? Isn't that kind of where a lot of churches are today? They're checking off a box. They're empty. They're waiting for some kind of passion to come in. So God's going to bless us somehow. Well, he's not going to bless you if you're going to just put it in the storehouse. All right. Find contentment. Luke chapter 12, verse 22. And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry. My wife loves this verse. Do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Do you have faith that God will take care of our needs? And if he has faith, and if we have faith that he takes care of our needs in our private life, why in the world should our church life be different? Why would we not think that he can't provide for the church if he's providing for all of our needs? You know I haven't missed a meal in 30 years that I've wanted to eat. In fact, every night that I've wanted a roof over my head, I've had a roof over my head. A few times I went camping and it wanted for doesn't count. The Lord has provided for us. And 
he will provide in the church in the same way. We have been sent by the living God. <laughs> We've been sent by the living God to share his life as a free gift to any who will accept. What kind of God would he be if he didn't empower us for the task to provide for our needs? He's a really good salesman. He's not the kind of guy that's going to say, oh, go give those guys a blessing and I'm just going to let you suffer. Now we suffer in different ways with persecution and stuff. That's different. All right. Deep down, the traditional model of ministry was developed in response to worry. Okay. What? You know, we had a bear come visit our house Ooh, the past yeah, week. Okay. Did that? He tore down our garbages and he displaced garbages all over the yard as he was searching for the miscellaneous food that was our overblessing and made it into the trash can. Okay? The Lord provided too much for us and the bear found the extra blessing. Okay? Now worry makes you do something. Worry generates action. And so what did we do? Right? Make sure the guns were, you know, accessible, just in case the bear kind of tore through the door, you know. I went and I got a camera, a field camera, and, and pointed it towards the garbages, just so we could see the bear if he happened to come by. And then I strapped the garbages with one of those tie straps to the deck, so he wouldn't be able to move them. He'd have to really get in there. If really... So, but I'm saying, like, when, when we worry, we do things to stop the worry and kind of maintain it. You know, we want to control it. Right? And that's what's happened. Deep down, the traditional model of ministry was developed in response to worry and a lack of faith in God's provision. Why do we baptize kids so early? Because we can't wait for them to make their own decision to accept Christ. Heaven forbid. What if they don't? So they don't get choice. They're baptized right away. And covetousness leads to worry, which manifests itself as disbelief, leading men to lean on their own provision rather than of that of the Father. All right. As the church age comes to an end and we get closer to the return of Christ, and I really think Christ could come back any day. I mean, when you see what's happening in the world and Christianity as a whole going through what it's going through on a global level, no one here should be like, oh man, Jesus is not. No, I mean, it, it's a possibility, a real possibility. Okay, as we get closer to the return of Christ, the Spirit of God is beginning to leave these systems of ministry, not every church, not every denomination, but in certain instances, He's leaving the broken empty storehouses. Okay? And allowing their disbelief to manifest as sin and infiltrate their processes. Could you imagine God calling something an abomination and a church board that claims to be, or a church assembly claiming to be filled with the same spirit of God and unity votes the total opposite and says, no, God doesn't find that an, an abomination. God actually calls that blessed. Do you think the Spirit of God is in those people still manifesting Himself in His holiness? He's leaving those systems. Not every church, not every person in every church, but in the system, the model of ministry, the religion, He's leaving and it is that sin born through unbelief that is now bringing spiritual death to these long-standing religious organizations. And that's what we have to see. And the problem is, is that it's happening at a faster rate. There's, there's denominations that were considered really healthy 20 years ago that now seem 
just spiritually cold, and you could just feel the Spirit of God leading them. Twenty years ago, I would have never thought the Methodist Church was about to go into a church split, straight down the denominational middle, this year. Now, I mean, their founder, John Wesley, was a man of holiness, and he wrote some really wonderful things about the thing that they just divided about. And they all claim to love John Wesley, but for some reason now, whoop, two different sides. It's interesting. Revival will come as we fully depend on God once again and let Him provide for tomorrow. So we've talked about the problem, now we're going to talk about the solution. It's nothing new. It feels new because we're so used to doing the old way. Okay? Well, let's talk about it. God is our provision. And he gives us an example. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom and no barn. Yet God feeds them. Isn't that amazing? How much more valuable are you than the birds? You are much more valuable. I mean, do you understand what he's saying there? Like, he talks about the grass in the field and the flowers. Like, if he clothes them with such beauty, will he not clothe us, the children of God? We can rely on the provision of the Lord. But what does that look like in a ministry, in the foundational building blocks, when we build something from the ground up. Because, like I said when we started, insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. And so all we're doing here is we're going to try something drastically different on a fundamental basis. And we're going to rely on God's provision. And we're going to see how far God can take it. And if he doesn't take it anywhere, we go, oh, God must not have wanted it. But if we let God take it, and he does, whoosh, do we get to brag about that? No. No, because he's the one that did it. He provided all the provision. The ravens don't deserve provision, and neither do we. Yet God has chosen to provide it to them. Here he shows us that we are worth far more to him. Therefore, he will also provide for our needs. So how will the fellowship model of ministry be different from the mistakes found in the traditional ministry? And this is where we have this flyer on the back. And I hope you'll be able to talk to someone when, you, when you're speaking to them. And you, you show them this, you'll be able to understand fundamentally why we're doing it this way. Okay? The first thing is no membership. Man, the first thing a church does when they can gather 150 people together in one spot, man, we get their names and their numbers, which I mean, I still like to do that. Like, I don't have your guys' numbers. It'd be nice to have your phone numbers, right? But still, you gather that information and then you say, hey, doing this thing, it's going great, let's all join together, and let's we're members. But membership automatically separates you from the Christian next to you, doesn't it? From the, the church next door, because you're a member of this, and they're a member of something else. Was that ever God's intention? If we're being honest. It was never His intention. Sure, we deal with false teachers. Sure, we don't always agree on everything that, that, that the scriptures reveal to us. But that doesn't mean that those who are Catholic are not brothers and sisters in Christ with those who are Anglican or charismatic. Does that make sense? But we treat each other like we're illegitimate children. Illegitimate stepchildren. Like you're, oh man. You can't take communion here. I'm sorry. Oh. Right? You're not good enough. Your finger is met you. We'll baptize you though, and then you can. So we got it right. 
Okay? We have no membership here, nor will we ever have membership. So, what keeps you here? If there's no piece of paper that keeps you here, I hope it's the Word of God. And I hope it's relationships that you build with each of us. That's what we want to keep you here. We don't want to try and trick you or manipulate you to keep you here. Does that make sense? So we're just, there's no membership. There's no pressure given. I think one of the most biblical and errant things that churches have grasped onto is the concept of the Christian tithe in the New Testament. The tithe was the governmental tax system of the Jews. It was there to make everything flow in their economy. Jesus gave us a different way. Just like he said, remember he said, don't commit adultery? That's the Old Testament. And then he said, if you look at a girl the wrong way, you've committed adultery. Right? He added to it. He, he made it a heart thing. God, I, know, I know people that have given money to the church religiously for 50 years and they're the worst Christians you could possibly imagine. They're horrible. But they give. Tithing is not a biblical New Testament concept. The scriptures they use to force a tithe are taken out of context. They're meant to... to to, to pressure you to give. You know what God says? What Jesus says? He says, your life is not your own. He says, your money, your time, your house, your checkbook, all those things are not yours. Those are mine. And I'm going to fulfill your needs. I want you to take it, whatever you need. But with your access, I want you to serve God. Does that mean give money to a church? No. It means that God is going to put someone in your life. There's going to be a flat tire somewhere. There's going to be someone whose house burned down in your neighborhood where you can give them a couch, where you can go cook them dinner, where, where you can go to Walmart for a, 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 a wife that's been kicked out of her house and fill her new apartment with those three kids with food. Because you are fulfilling the needs with the access that God has given you. Let me ask you this. If a church has no building and no assets, how much money does that church need to run? If the pastor is willing to work for free, which I am, how much money do you need to, to raise? Does that mean money's bad? No, I'm taking money. Yeah, we can use your money. The more money we raise, the more ministry we can do. Right now, I work a part-time job. Well, I work a full-time job, and then another full-time I work a lot. If we make enough money, maybe you guys come together and you say, you know what? We want you to be able to spend more time in ministry and coming to our houses and going and spending time in the hospitals. So we're going to help redeem a day of your work, and we're going to give you a little bit of money. Now, is that something that I deserve? No, not really. I work for free because the Lord called me to minister. But am I going to turn down a blessing of God if He wants me to serve more and more effectively? No, I'm not. But you see how that's different from tithe. Tithe in a religious system is, oh, do you want the perks of membership? Oh, you need to go, oh, we're going to get into your 501, you know, your investments, your portfolios. Oh, did you just sell that uh, old car that you had there, that collectible? Oh, what did you sell that for? Hmm. Did, oh, tax time! Ding, 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 ding! No. You know, I've seen so many people leave the church because the church cared more about the money than they did about the people. And every other sermon was about giving. And you know when the storehouses are empty, how do you get more stuff in the storehouses? 
And you get the rich tithe. Oh, you guys are horrible. We're not blessed because you're not giving. No. You're not blessed because you're not giving away. All right. No membership. There's no pressure giving. There's no owned buildings in a fellowship church. Now, we're constructing a model. There's churches in Africa that are going to be starting using this model. We already have a couple pastors lined up, and we're going to be starting to help other churches across the country, pastors, start using this model. Okay? They're not going to own a building, a church building. They're not going to own big assets. And it's fundamentally important. Do you know that most of the fights that, that start in the church are over the stuff that's in the church? Isn't that interesting? People are stuff too. What happens if you take all that away? <clears throat> what do you fight about? If I'm here and I'm preaching the word of the Lord, and you're receiving the food and you feel fed and you come back and I feed you and you're learning more. What in the world can you fight about? Because there's nothing. You can't fight unless you want to fight over this pulpit here. I mean, oh man, I want that pulpit over to the front or to the side. We need a cross. <laughs> there's nothing to fight about. There's no church board. We'll have elders that talk to each other. We're not going to have a church board. Because all we need is a called pastor who's doing his best to serve the, the Lord and the kingdom of God the best he can. And he takes, it's a relationship. He listens to people and listens to what he says, but then he makes the decision that he feels God calling him to do. And he does it. It doesn't get bound up in a committee. The church is a people, and we invest the excess of his provision into others, not into stuff. And this, this is to answer Joan's question. She asked, what in the world is this 501c3 thing? Okay? Churches have been tricked over the past 50 years. What happened was, was uh, churches, they're uh, considered a non-profit. Well, before the definition of a nonprofit, churches were just churches. Okay? Of course you gave to the church because the window needed fixed and you just gave to the church. Well, what happened was the government wanted to make a special way to give you the title of a church that's a nonprofit so that you could have someone pay for the window and they wouldn't get taxed for it. Well, they weren't taxed before. Now they wanted to tax you or find ways to tax other people. And so they were tricked, and it took a while, it took like 10 years, and then they kept adding enticing things for churches as organizations to become a person under the law. So instead of just a group of people meeting together and learning about God and going home, now we're a person under the law. Do you know that a person, that you can't sue a church unless they're a person under the law? How do you sue a group of random people that meet together spontaneously? Okay. How do you take assets of a group of people that meet together spontaneously? You'd have to individually go and tackle each one of them find their assets, and shake them upside down and see what came out. Okay? Do you know how easier it is now for the government to say, oh, church, and all your 150,000 members, you are now a person under the law, and now we can take you to court if you don't do this, and you don't do that, and, oh, we don't like that, so you can't do that, and there's going to be these penalties if you do this, all these things happen because they are a person under the law. And so they were tricked into taking on a 501c3. And with the large denominations, it's just automatic. Like if you're in a Baptist church, you're part of that Baptist 501c3 number. It's all like the same number. 
the Nazarene church, it's all linked together. Uh, if the government wanted to sue the church, and they did it enough, they could take every single asset that the church has, every building, uh, because they're all linked. Uh, the denomination owns all of it. And so if the denomination is sued, everything would be gone. Now, isn't that a lot easier than persecuting every little individual person that has ever gone to church and turning them upside down and shaking and see what comes out? You know that there's no law that says that we can't gather in the freedom that we have in this country and share a religious belief and talk about it and spontaneously worship the Lord. It's a right that we have. And so we're fundamentally saying in this model of ministry that we don't want to be a person under the law. If you want to come after us, you come after all of us. Okay? Now that makes it a little tougher with insurance. So we've had to work out that in our model. So what happens is, has anyone had an Amway business before? Or Quick Star, uh, Mary Kay, Pampered Chef, all these kind of sub-businesses? That's what I am. Okay? I have a Pampered Chef church. Okay? Does the government care about Church? No, because there's no money in it. Okay? So, it allows me to get insurance as a business. I have an LLC called Oaks Ministries. I can help other pastors develop their own pampered chef business so that they can get insurance, so that they can have meetings. And that's all they need. If we need a new cord, oh, we just got new speaker cords, right? I paid for those speaker cords because I am the church for the government. If the government wants to come after the church, they are going to come after me, and if they throw me in jail, then you guys just pray really hard, and I'm I'll, sure something will happen. Okay? If they want to come after and destroy our church, they're going to end up taking everything that I have. But what is that going to do for you guys? Yeah. Well, you know how much energy it would take for them to come after each one of you? Well, <laughs> it would take a lot of energy. Okay? So what we're talking about here is a, a different way to construct ministries with the foundation of a pastor who is the teacher, who is sharing, who is feeding, the people that gather are being fed, they are intertwined in relationships, and that's it. There's no assets. We grow. If we grow too much and Sally Sue in the back or Sam, he gets called to preach, I'm going to take him under my wing and I'm going to show him how to, to, to search the Word of God. I'm going to teach him how to build a sermon. I'm going to teach him how to, to share the Word of God. I'm going to bring him with me on, on my visits to the hospital. Okay? And eventually he's going to reach a point where we're going to be able as a church say, we believe in you. Let's empower you to start a church. You don't have to move anywhere. You don't got to go spend thousands and thousands of dollars on an education that indoctrinates you into our system. We're going to let you, oh, you're working at parties? We're going to build a church right around that parties. All those employees are going to start being part of your church because you're going to be such a witness. And it's going to get over into the Elam home. It's going gonna, it's gonna to permeate over into the quick trip. And that church is going to grow with that person. And they're going to get too big. But there's going to be someone in there that they're going to be able to train. And we're going to help them get their own pampered chef business. Do you see how this works? Do you know how it doesn't work? Is when I say, oh, I'm in charge because I started the first one. I'm I'm the Right? I'm going to give myself a special title. Because I started the first one. It's my idea. Right? No. The whole point. 
point is that we give away the access and I can have a relationship with him and a relationship with her and together we can form a group in town here where we're getting together as called ministers of the gospel and we're not trying to take people from each other. We're trying to help expand and we're trying to say, you know what, hey, uh, these people, they're not fitting in our church but you've got uh, Sally and Jim over there, and I think they really uh, build a relationship with them. Uh, they're both really inefficient. Why don't we try and get them together? You see, and that's growing the kingdom. That's not who we have control. So, I hope you can see this fundamental difference that we're trying to teach here. The old system relies on control stemming from worry and covetousness as they try to hold on to the blessing of God. And when you hold on to the blessing of God, you build bigger barns because God's going to bless the fans off you. And eventually what happens is you sit around and your grain bins are empty and there's 20 of you left and there's no kids Nobody to teach Sunday school, and you just sit there and you pay the bills. That's bad. And I know so many Christians right now, but that's exactly what they're doing. They're going to spend the next five to ten years wasting their stewardship of who God has called them to be instead of actively ministering to their community. They're going to sit in four walls, complain a bunch, and make sure the tar gets repaid. So besides all the monetary value and all that great stuff, obviously it's all publishing. So when people are asking us what we're doing here, and very skeptical people are not going to lie. Sure. We're pretty much called out here. I've heard it many times. Yep, we are so How, besides fundamental, teach the scriptures. And how do we do that? Our we take a paragraph. We, I, I, we're going through the book of John. We're going to get back into the book of John. We take a paragraph. We go verse by verse. And we dig out what God is trying to say to us in that piece of scripture. We don't go to psychology. I don't give you the five ways to have a better life. Okay? It's not a self-help thing. We go, wow. Man, this is horrible. That just happened. What in the world is God trying to teach us? How, how can we learn about God from this? And we talk about it, and it's a discussion. It's not me telling you. It's a back and forth discussion. And we want to make sure our kids get the same thing that, that we're getting as we pull stuff out of the scripture. Now, if they call that a cult, then they can call that a cult. Because I'm done playing Christianity. I'm done playing the, the red tape. I'm done playing the control. There are people that are dying in our communities and are going to hell because the church fundamentally messed up. And there is such a harvest around us that if we as one body in unity embrace this vision and go out and minister to the lost people that are around us, we are going to have our socks blown off. And we're going to face the same hurdle that these other churches have faced. Because once it happens, and maybe that's why it hasn't happened yet. Once it happens, it can happen in three weeks. We're going to the state fair, and who knows, we might have 55, 60 people here in three weeks. When Jesus blows the socks off this ministry, we have to have the foundation in place that we don't make the same mistakes. Does that make sense? And that's what the people that are, have left the church want. They don't want to be a number. They don't want to be cattle that's corralled. And they want to learn about God. 
They're biblically illiterate. A lot of them are. They want to know the truth. And we're going to give it to them. And we're going to discuss. And we're going to get it comfortable. And we're going to leave here sometimes feeling queasy. Because we talked about something that we haven't talked about before. And just, ooh. What do you got? We talked about the membership. Basically, even though there is no membership, once you come in, You remember the family of God. Yes. And that's why I'm saying this this is the first week that we lost a family. And, and it's that we have to process that. And there's the worldly part of us that, wow, we lost a family. We did something wrong. Or, or what can we do to keep that family? Or what could we have done different to keep that family? And we have to understand that our job is not to keep families. Our job is to take the blessing that God gives us and share the access. And there's going to be families that come in. There's going to be families that go. We want to split. We, we want to plan church splits. And it's going to be exciting when we do that the first time. When, when there's so many people in here, and there's a called person here, and we say, guys, get ready for this. I know it's really fun that there's 120 of us fitting into this small space here. And we have a great worship team because we have like 12 people that play the guitar now. Okay, but we're going to take three of those guitar players and everyone that lives in Foley, because there's like 25 of you guys that live in Foley, and we're going to help you start the ministry in Foley. And we're not just sending you, we're going to help you. We're going to pray for you. We're going to help you find a facility. Uh, if it costs money per month, we're going to help you get that facility paid for until you have the core group there and, and can do that on your own. And then we're not going to charge you for it five years later because, oh, we started you. We need 10% uh, of uh, the royalty fees because uh, we're your sponsor. Right? No, we do. <laughs> so do you see the difference? We are the cult of Malacca. We are the that with us. We are the Malacca cult. I'm okay with that time. Okay? But I tell you what, if you see me preaching anything that's outside of this word, you come up and you stand up and you say, this is outside of the word of God. And if we can't agree to disagree on if it's a gray area or something, but if it's blatant and I'm just preaching something that's totally opposite, you're, you're perfectly, 100% justified in standing up and walking out that door and never coming back. But you better talk to me first because you better love me enough to do that. Because I'm not perfect. And, <laughs> right? and I tell you what, I push the envelope of the Word of God because I'm not afraid to say the things that I feel God saying to me. And a lot of times that crosses denominational lines and it challenges us. And you will hear truths here that you've never heard in a traditional church because they're unwilling. It's too dangerous to say it. And that's where we have to have faith enough to give each other the grace that you know my heart and that you know I'm trying to get you closer to God and I'm not trying to get more money out of you. There's no money. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> right? But you know what? God, <laughs> but God provides. And you know what? Even if I didn't get paid for 20 years doing this, I get paid in heaven, right? And that's okay. I'm okay with that. He pays really well, I hear. So let's wrap up here. Um, oh, the other important part of here is that, and this is to talk about what we teach about. Most importantly, Jesus, or the Logos of God, is our doctrine. We're not going to have doctrines. We're going to have opinions. I have an opinion about baptism. I have an opinion about infant baptism. I've got an opinion about communion and if the uh, wafers turn into the actual blood or not. Okay? But I can have unity with you 
And we can agree to disagree as long as we're both in the scriptures. Amen? And we're going to learn. Because you know something that I don't know, and I know a lot that you don't know. And we're going to leave this place learning a little bit more about God. Amen. And I hope that's what has happened today. I want you to be able to explain why this model of ministry is different. Because people think we're called. And we're not a call. We're trying to honor God. We're trying to have the Lord be our provision. And this is His provision in our doctrine. Amen? If the Holy Spirit is the one teaching us all things, then we don't need... You know I've seen manuals that are thicker than the Bible? I mean, can you imagine that? Like if Jesus, if Jesus said, you know, 4,000 words in the Scriptures, but the church has 8,000 words in their doctrine, you think there's something wrong there. Right? <laughs> so, all right, so let's wrap up. <laughs> all right, God is about to bless our socks off. I want you to be prepared to work. You guys are having too much fun. <laughs> God is about to bless our socks off. Okay, that may be with people, maybe with resources. Who knows how it's going to be? But he blesses people that rely on his provision. And we're going to have a choice. When that time comes, will we need to decide, are we going to try and hold on to that blessing and construct ourselves bigger barns? Or are we going to have faith to understand that the excess of God is not ours, it is meant to be given away? And you will see in faith that the more we give away, the more God will trust us with. It's a mystery. It's a mystery that a church board can never fully do after a certain amount of years because there's too much to risk. In this model of ministry, we can risk everything because you know what? They can't take our building. We don't have a building. If they take half our people, that's okay. We just keep ministering with the people that are here. Okay, if the, if the biggest, if the five biggest givers die in a, in a freak airplane accident, that doesn't change what we do. We keep on going. If all the youth leave, we just don't have a youth program. If a bunch of youth come back, we have a big youth program. Yay! I like the last one. We're flexible. He's our provision. Alright. It is easy to say that God needs a building and a denominational headquarters to reach more people with the gospel. And you'll hear, 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 this, hear this lie all the time. Oh, well, we have this missions program. And you guys can't do missions. You can't be part of this large, awesome thing we're doing. And it's a total lie. And we have to realize that right now, America is the mission field. You can literally walk 100 feet from your house, unless you live in the country, you know, like I do. But you know what I mean? A hundred feet in your house, in, from your yard, and you will meet people that God is calling you to love and to give that access to. There's a grumpy old man that is a Christian, and you can go over and mow his lawn for free. And he's going to be like, why are you doing that? Why are you spending time doing this or doing that? And because the love of God is flowing through us. And you're going to confuse people. You're going to have people that say bad things about you, and you're going to go and love on them. And God's going to use it to bring them to the kingdom of God. Okay? Jesus is our king. Jesus is our high priest. We don't need a pope. We don't need a general superintendent. Okay? You have a called pastor that has been called to share the word of God. It doesn't make me elevated and special. Okay? It just means that I'm the one that's called to feed you, and, and it's my job to feed you and, and for you to be fed and to, to send you out. I'm truly hoping that there are people in this room that grow up to be pastors and ministers. And it can happen. Okay? Uh, the Spirit of God teaches us all things through the Word of God, and therefore, this is our manual. The breath of God is our manual, and it's all we need. We can rely on the...
vision of God to build whose kingdom? His kingdom. We're going to let God go. Every day we're going to ask Him for our provision. His provision. He's going to give it to us. Some days it'll just be barely enough to feed us. And other days, we're not going to be able to store the excess. So what are we going to do with that excess? We're going to give it away as best we can. Alright? Okay. Let us show this community that we don't need them to come to our church. Yeah. That's fundamentally different than what most churches preach. We do not need people to come to our church. We are the church, and we are going to bring the overflowing excess of Christ's blessing to our community where people are. And in many ways, that's harder than the old model, because the old model, you just showed up and you went home. This model, you're carrying Christ with you, and you're dispensing the bread and the blood to others, even though they don't know. It's taking ownership of the body of Christ that you're a part of. Any questions? All right, let's wrap up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, and, and Lord, this topic is important. It is fundamental for what we are doing in this new type of model of revised ministry that you've called us to. Lord, there are literally thousands of people in Malacca that know who Jesus is, that have read the Word of God, and have they've looked at the church, which is the billboard of Jesus Christ, and they didn't like what they see because the Lord, the God, was His name was taken in vain, and it, it didn't look like Jesus. It looked like the world. And so people have left. And they have this bad taste of Jesus in their mouth. And Lord, it's going to be extremely hard to reach these people. But it's worth it. It's worth the energy. And there's, there's people that you're going, and you're going into their hearts, and you're preparing them, and, and you're, you're lighting a fire in their bellies. That you want the power and the presence of God in their lives again. And they're yearning and they're seeking after that. And they don't know what to do. They don't want to go back into the same old systems and the same old church. Just to see the same old check the box dead religion. Lord I pray you light a fire in the people that are here. And the people that join us. That this community would begin to see the true presence and power of God. Not the speaking in tongues and the jumping up and down and the gibberish. But that your name, the blessing that comes through your spirit, the love, the access that flows through us in holiness, would be so confusing to this broken world that they would be drawn to your light in such a way that you will bless the socks on us. And Lord, I pray that you would keep us humble and that you would prepare our hearts to receive that blessing in such a way that we don't try and control it, that we don't try and manipulate it and try and hold on to it. Because every, your, your mercies are new. Every morning, great is thy faithfulness. So Lord, I pray that you would allow this church to live daily in your provision alone. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen.